Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all here. I'm Martin Jean. I direct the ISM. Great pleasure to have you here, and of course, great pleasure to welcome Jacqueline Oshiro as this year's Lana Schwebel Lecturer. The Lana Schwebel Lecture, Memorial Lecture in Religion and Literature was begun in 2008 in memory of our late colleague, uh, Lana Schwebel. Lana was on the faculty here from 2002 to 2006. She was a medievalist who, studied, who, who taught courses in religion and literature uh, until she left here to teach at uh, Yeshiva University in New York and, uh, and taught there for one year and then was killed tragically uh, in a car accident the summer afterwards. Uh, her, her family, who was not able to uh, join us uh, here tonight, uh, left a uh, memorial in her honor uh, so that her name would always be remembered every year at Yale University in per perpetuity. Um, Lana was indefatigable uh, and uh, let's see how to, how to say this. When she would come into my office uh, asking for something or pointing out something that I didn't do, she would say it with kindness but directness and uh, with a kind of incision of clarity that would, um, you know, slice bread, basically. Uh, she was, uh, uh, she uh, had a, a terrific command of uh, both herself and the English language. And, uh, and I was the better for it. I learned very much from this uh, brilliant young scholar and, uh, and dear, dear, dear friend. Um, the the Schwebel lecture, as I've indicated, has uh, existed here since '08, and and through it we've were, we've had the honor to bring such luminaries as uh, Robert Alter, who was the first lecturer, um, Robert Pinsky, Helen Whitney, Peter Cole, Fanny Howe, and our own Christian Wyman. In fact, gave the Schwebel lecture before he was on the faculty, and now it's uh, my pleasure to call on him, senior lecturer in religion literature, to introduce this year's lecture. Thank you. Welcome to Marquand Chapel. There is a poem in Jack Onoshiro's new book called Casa del Fascio, House of the Fascist, or the Fascist House, in which a speaker is moved to awe by a modernist building that's been built by a terrible man. It's a modernist building, all angles and planes, and she describes it as a partition in a nimble truce with synthesis. And then she goes on to wonder, what business does a fascist have with light, and why am I wholly susceptible? It's an old question, but no less urgent for that. How do we respond to beautiful art made by terrible people? Or better, why do we respond to beautiful art made by terrible people, even when we know its provenance? Many of Oshiro's poems occur right at this crux between the ethical and the aesthetic, the earthly and the spiritual. And what I admire about them is both the way they refuse to take any easy way out. I gaze and gaze is how that poem about the fascist house ends. And the way they are continually moving from aesthetic questions to much broader ones. Why do we so love our lives when we so clearly recognize the suffering that is in them? And a step further, as you'll hear in her poem, Tikkun Olam, how is it that we so love our lives when we so clearly recognize the suffering that is in them? I don't mean to suggest that Jackie's poems are all quite as sober as this, because the first thing that you'll notice in her poems is that she's quite funny. It's a particular kind of humor. It's the kind of irreverence that you recognize way down its, at its depths as a kind of primary reverence. She's also one of the most formally inventive and dexterous poets that you will ever encounter. That, too, you will hear in the range of poems that she'll read. Jacqueline Oshiro is distinguished professor of English and creative writing at the University of Utah. It would take me quite a while to list all of her books and the prizes and honors that she has won, so I won't. I will simply say that for many people, she has created a body of work that makes these boundaries I have mentioned, aesthetics and ethics, contemplation and action, art and life, less immutable than they can often seem. Her poems are, to use Kenneth Burke's phrase, equipment for living. We'll have a Q&A after, so if you have questions, Jackie will stay up here and, and answer any questions. For now, please welcome Jacqueline Oshiro.
That was really much more than I deserve, but thank you very much. As is this lecture in such a distinguished line of people, I'm honored and slightly horrified that you couldn't find someone better than me to be in that line, but I'll do, do what I can. Um, I, I've, called this, um, I've called this lecture Lifting the Gemstones from the Bible. Uh, it's not really a lecture, it's really a poetry reading, because what I have to say about the Bible, I've tried to say in poems over the years, and I thought I would begin to try to explain why it is that the Bible means so much to me. And I guess I really was quite literal-minded as a child. And when I was told that I have to see myself as if I got out of Egypt and I walked through the Red Sea, I really believed it. And I really, really believed that these were my stories and that this history was my personal history. And, um, and I, in a very long poem that I won't read, I say something about a Jew's attitude toward history. So, um, so I, think, you know, I, I think that I'll just try to, to explain it. I'll just read that tiny little section from this poem about the Alhambra. And I say, even history, once my own discipline, and still a clear obsession, eludes me though I'm rarely much outside its purview, since, call it inertia, sentimentality, indoctrination, culture, the long, long view, albeit lopsided and paranoid, is the go-to vantage point of any Jew, with or without the patronage of God. It's personal for us, a family story. We know each episode from the inside with the barefaced inexactitude of memory, one part denial, three parts exaggeration. So that's what I have to say about history. And what I have to say about the Bible, uh, I think I hope will become clear as I read these poems. The easiest way for me to do it is to start from the beginning. And I have to say, at college, I, I had already noticed that things weren't really so fair for women in the Bible. So I wrote a couple of poems about biblical women, one of which actually made it into my first book. Um, I didn't give it epigraphs, but it has two hovering behind it. One is, and the Lord saw that Leah was hated, and he opened her womb. And the other is, the hands were the hands of Esau, but the voice was the voice of Jacob. This is Deceptions Leah, written exactly 40 years ago. All that time you worked for my sister, I embroidered veils, white with gold threads running through. They brought me one most gentle night beneath smooth hands, while the warm voice of Jacob whispered, Rachel. Um, and I'm gonna, this is a bit of a cheat, because there's a poem I started about that time, and never, uh, never, I mean, I finished it, as it were, but it was so terrible. Um, and somebody was asking me about writing about the Bible, and I quoted this beginning of a poem I'd written as an undergraduate and said I could never get anywhere with it. And he said, well, that doesn't sound bad. You should really try. So I, I now, this is the newest poem I'm going to read tonight, is one that goes off of what I wrote 40 years ago. Um, it's in sections, but I won't read out the numbers. It is free verse. Um, and the sections are divided with numbers of asterisks. So the first is one, then two, then three. This being the divinity school at Yale University, I'm going to assume you know the story of Joseph. So I'm not going to explain anymore. This is called Autobiography with Joseph. Sometimes there are only stars waiting to bow down. Sometimes there are only fat oxen. But then, with no warning, they've thrown you in a pit, sold you, bound you in Egyptian jail. It's dark there. You don't speak the language. I left this unfinished 40 years ago. What can I tell you? Nothing changes. The skies do still, the right place, the right time, reveal themselves magnanimous with stars, but I've yet to master the intractable syntax of the insular vernacular of darkness. 
Luckily, every year in mid-July or so, a fresh crop of crickets, keen, intuitive, with a worldly, nuanced, linguistic acumen, will all at once noisily arrive. Until their departure at the first frost offer nightly simultaneous translations. The darkness, it turns out, is even more at odds than we, hourly wavering from jubilation, 11 sheaves of wheat down on their knees, to what can only be described as melancholia. Darkness of a copse of firs, moonless dark, darkness of the clouds eclipsing darkness, darkness of the sky before the heralded arrival, or perhaps even greater darkness after the departure of those desperate, prostrate stars. Is there anyone who couldn't tell this story? Sometimes darkness, sometimes stars. Your one good garment, an indulgence from your distant father, stolen off your back and stained with blood. Van Gogh even told it. You don't believe me? Go to MoMA. Press through the crowds taking selfies. Surely it's no coincidence that Starry Night contains precisely, count them, 11 stars. He knew his Bible, Van Gogh, had studied it for years, once planned to be a pastor like his father. Perhaps, who knows, he'd have been better off with God. He'd certainly have avoided swallowing that lead-filled paint, cadmium yellow, his favorite. We, however, would be seriously diminished, have only cursory experience of apple orchards in spring, olive groves, almond blossoms, cypresses, what crows over a wheat field can unwittingly accomplish. We'd have to trust our own deficient eyes. Just as I, without Joseph, couldn't have begun to write a poem, where would I have found the fatal wherewithal without the provocation of those prostrate sheaves of wheat, that makeshift constellation kowtowing across the heavens, its 11 chosen emissaries plummeting to earth until they're extinguished at my feet? Of course, how did I miss this? They're shooting stars, the bent backs, the prostrate torsos, the curve of obeisance, genuflection, the arc of a meteor across a sky, one brief spectacular salam. Unless it's the gilt tip of a scepter, straining to anoint you from some vastly inaccessible and soon to be dubious beyond. It's outsized visitation, impossibly bright, compelling your for once intact attention on an errand so innately magisterial it holds even ensuing time at bay. Nonetheless, it's very quickly gone. Sometimes, there are only stars waiting to bow down, only afterwards, but then for years and years, a fitful harvest of famished corn. That's Joseph. No, don't applaud, because then if you don't applaud, I'll think, oh, they hated that poem, so don't do that. Okay, thank you, though. Um, <laughs> um, I have a series of poems uh, called Scattered Psalms, in which I refer to Psalms. Peter's been really nice to those. I'll read the shortest of them. It's called Space Psalm. And basically the idea that try to get in on the territory that David didn't know about. So he didn't know much about outer space. Space Psalm. Let stars reverse their courses, hallelujah. Let planets flaunt their necklaces of ice. Let suns confound eclipses, hallelujah. Let moons scavenged radiance rejoice. Let galaxies recluster, hallelujah. Let nebulae uncloud and celebrate. Let meteors spread banners, hallelujah. Let black holes unleash astonished light. Let comets jump their orbits, hallelujah to jangle inadvertent atmospheres, 
with rumors of the distance, hallelujah, anecdotes, songs, suspicions, prayers. Okay, so now I'll read the poem from which this lecture gets its title. Uh, it's, though the title of the poem is different, it's Slim Fantasia on a Few Words from Hosea. Um, I, uh, I live in Utah, and uh, guess what? Not a lot of people in Utah know how to chant in synagogue from the prophets and the Torah, and, and I do, alas for me, so I have to do it quite often. And I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of this biblical poetry does come from the fact that I have chanted these things, and you have to go over them a lot in order to chant them. Though this particular poem comes from sitting, a rare moment when I wasn't blabbing in the back of the synagogue, and I actually heard these words, take words with you and return to God, and I just couldn't believe it take words with you and return to God. So that had to be a poem. Um, one other thing I mentioned, aerograms. Some of you know what those are, some of you really don't. And they were these very, very thin blue pieces of paper that would fold up and they were the cheapest way to send a letter across the ocean. This was something people did, people actually sent letters across the ocean. And they were this beautiful shade of sky blue and very thin and you would fill every tiny piece of available space so that you could write to your friends. Anyway, this, they're mentioned here. This is, again, free verse, slim fantasia on a few words from Hosea. Take words with you and return to God. One, poor Hosea, who can stomach him? Marrying that harlot, leaving her to languish in the desert, giving his own kids those vile names. Not to mention speeches full of graphic retribution. Probably the people if they ever gathered in the first place, after a phrase or two, just walked away. Me, I can't even read him on an ideal afternoon at the perfect distance of a holy language. But it turns out I'm the one he's talking to. Hey, big mouth poet lifting the Jeb stones from the Bible, take words with you and return to God. Two, I love the way he doesn't say which ones. I'm tempted to bring along the entire dictionary. That way, God can choose whatever words he likes. But what if he starts ripping out whole pages, declaring everything on them and their synonyms off limits, says, okay, I'll take praise, Torah, God, you can find your own words, leave me out of this. But here's a tip, you're focused on the wrong half of the equation, the quotation. The important section is return to God. Three, by which he'd have a point. But what if he doesn't tell me how to get there? Where did I think I was heading with my OED? The holy temple's been destroyed. And in its place, according to the radio this very morning, they've got live bullets and a vindictive crowd shouting something in Arabic I can't make out, but it isn't take words with you and return to God. Four. It's not as if, by the way, I have any kind of handle on what is meant here by the word return. When exactly was I ever with him? The closest I've come, if I've been in the vicinity at all, has only ever been a matter of words. The kind Hosea's after, interchangeable with beaten gold, that show up in the lining of the holy of holies I didn't know was lodged inside my brain. Five, maybe it's like an algebraical equation in which the word and stands in for equals and take words with you means return to God. Six, or maybe I was wrong about that crowd. Hosea's words were uttered, but with, an, uh, with a different intonation. It's an imperative to die, return to God. And take words with you is the stone thrower's signal that he's throwing stones because he's tired of words and more words, especially the ones delivered by an inaudible landlord whose ancient promises have now expired. Seven. 
But shouldn't I describe this day, another perfect one, the sky as usual uninterrupted, only at its edge a strip of cloud, the torn off fragment of a holy page reading, take words with you and return to God. Eight, I'd love to take dictation on a cloud. I'd pluck a feather from a passing cormorant and moisten it with remnants from a seven-sided snowflake sequestered in an overly warm fog. At least I think it might make an imprint on a cloud. Then, if I found a way to fold it up, I'd take it with me and return to God. Nine. Or maybe I'd be returning to Hosea, or not Hosea, but the scolding place I suspect Hosea's words have been, or not, let's be realistic, the very place I'd settle for their general direction. 10. Of course, needless to say, I'd lose sight of them. Even my one cloud has disappeared. Heaven's rejoicing, it can finally get back on schedule, delivering its daily empty aerogram. And I, like a fool, will stand here squinting at the sun, reading the entire text aloud. Don't tell me it's empty. I'll take any interruption, anything the sky will dare to hold, anything but Hosea and his crackpot exhortation. Take words with you and return to God. And if that was not a strange enough poem, I'll read another poem that I really wouldn't dare to read anywhere but at Divinity School. It actually has, you know, again, I was, it actually has commentary on the Bible, uh, which, you know, maybe is an odd thing to put in a poem, but I, I stand by it. Um, and, uh, and this poem really does have a lot to say about my relationship to the Bible. And it does refer to what was actually two weeks ago, the Torah reading, Chaye Sara. And I actually read the Haft Torah, which I refer to in here. Um, so things have improved in that regard. Uh, there are a couple of words that you probably know. Shul, Yiddish for synagogue. Bris is a circumcision. Chupa is the canopy under which you're married. And I hope... That'll do it. Uh, I mentioned Paolo Uccello, a truly great Renaissance painter, but he does have a painting, I put it on the uh, cover of a different book, in which he has a Jew and his family burned at the stake. So that's a little problematic. Uh, oh, and now I've lost my place. Okay, so this, the other, the other reason that I'm, I'm reading this poem is that, um, I didn't get Art Nouveau. This is, took place in an Art Nouveau synagogue in Paris by one of the great Art Nouveau architects, Guimau. And um, I fell in love with Art Nouveau two books later in my most recent book. But it, you need, it's all or nothing. And it, you can't go halfway with it. So that's part of the problem with the Art Nouveau synagogue. But anyway, this is at the Art Nouveau synagogue, Rue Pavé. Fool that I am, I think I've come for the design. And it is something to see an orthodox shul kept so obsess obsessively in line by a rule as antithetical as style. The other matrons and I have a splendid view. From here on the women's balcony, it's almost beautiful. Though it's also slightly farcical, this Art Nouveau. So much silly posturing, yet such a plum. Yesterday at the museum, as I wandered through each increasingly excessive nouveau room, I thought of every preening piece of furniture as an ordinary household item playing dress up. Where does a sofa get such hauteur? Where, for that matter, does a house of prayer its curves off-center, contrary to nature, each angle elongated to a flare, the walls and ceilings far too high and lean, every pew, table, bookstand, handrail, chair, trimmed with a telltale long-stemmed lily design, repeated in fixtures, moldings, even the fretwork I'm peering through, we women mustn't be seen. Though some of the lily light bulbs have gone dark, and the plans could not have allowed that ugly curtain on the, 
or the golden lions on the holy ark, not to mention these thick, round-shouldered men with untrimmed beards and huge, broad-brimmed black hats. The place calls for an entirely different specimen, tall and thin in peacock feather waistcoats, their languid fingers swathed in pearl-white gloves, dangling cigarette holders or lorgnettes. Not one would look at all like he believes in anything, and certainly not the call of the admittedly not very likely set of narratives that a few of the men have started to unscroll on the outsized center table for that purpose. I doubt they notice lilies on the wall. From up here anyway, they seem oblivious to everything around them but the task at hand, the opened Torah for one of them to bless, and then the portion of the week to chant so beautifully, I too know where I am, though I have no text to follow. This very instant, the angels have come to call on Abraham, which means a long morning of upheaval, Sarah's cryptic laugh, the end of Sodom, Hagar in the desert with Ishmael, each story punctuated by a blessing, blessing words, my most beloved ritual. Though I can't do it here, indeed I'm trespassing as it is, wearing jeans, my head uncovered. Probably I shouldn't even sing. It's forbidden for women's voices to be heard. They're too erotic, they're too erotic apparently. I beg your pardon. Recently, Barbara Streisand herself was barred from some Israel thing in Madison Square Garden, though she'd offered to donate her performance. I usually have no patience for this ancient burden, but how can I explain? It's my inheritance, a cluster of stars of David on the Paris map. I would have worn a dress, but I came by chance, marking spots only a few streets up from my first stop on the Rue du Sévigny. And I remembered standing years ago on the doorstep of an Art Nouveau synagogue in the Marais. It was closed that afternoon, so here I am. It had to be one of those stars, and today is Saturday, though I already know these stories' outcome, and I certainly hadn't meant to stay. But in the enlightened synagogue I attend at home, the Torah isn't chanted quite this way. This man gives each word a subtle emphasis, as if the simplest pronoun might convey a mystery incomparably precious. Its rise from the parchment on the table through the silver pointer to his voice, an obligation so inviolable, you'd think he'd have to fast for 40 days if he were to drop a single syllable, as a person is required to fast who even sees the dropping of a Torah on the ground. Does it count, I've always wondered, if you close your eyes? Or seeing a Torah falling, turn around? Are the blind absolved? What if it's dark? There isn't a punishment for dropped sound, but the Torah must be read with no mistake. The reader rereads anything misread, and the entire congregation is obliged to check lest some holy letter go unsaid. This man hasn't been corrected once. One doesn't blunder with the words of God. It has nothing to do with reward or penance. The rules are just a labyrinthine metaphor for perfect and elusive reverence, which, for this one instant, I can almost hear as the blessings over, the chant continues. And after these things, what I've been waiting for, a chapter I was made in Hebrew to memorize, our teacher read each verse with one dropped word, which we would have to fill in for a quiz. So I can hear the words before they're uttered. 
I'm calm throughout the tense, well-planned charade, the kindling wood, the altar, the binding cord, the knife stretched above the young boy's head, all an indelible, flamboyant sham. Abraham knows this, which is why he's said to Isaac, God will provide the ram. To his servants, I and the boy will come back. Hasn't God already appeared and promised him a covenant with this very Isaac and with his heirs numberless as stars and here they are below me dressed in black their promised presence ringing in their ears and I skeptic that I am also a promise and these children running up and down the stairs living proof that God can be magnanimous that I myself could even make a claim on something unearthly and enormous Here's God now, reassuring Abraham. It's not a question of faith at all, but story. Sometimes words themselves can offer asylum, and if victory's endurance, victory, albeit a little scattered and far-flung. Whether there's a God or not, he's robed in glory by which I mean the supple Hebrew tongue, as it extracts the majesty from each named thing and orders it to utter a new song. But what's happening here? What's all this shouting? It's as if an explosion hit the room, wild singing to the man who made the blessing. They're not throwing candy so he isn't a groom. All the hooting, mazel toving, clapping, cheers must mean his newborn girl's been given a name. One more of the numberless as stars. Being wicked and something of a killjoy, I think I'd also cheer for a new workhorse. But I'm a bit unfair. Joy is joy, and here it is below me, as noisy, pure, as it would be at any bris for a new boy. I'm not even averse to the special prayer that she grow to Torah, chuppah, and good deeds. The trick is pinning down what those are. Not a problem for her if this man succeeds. And who am I to hope that she'll rebel? Surely there are far worse childhoods than running on the stairway of a shul, catching bits of language such as this. Perhaps she'll listen to it. Who can tell? Don't mistake me, I'm not envious, but it would be dishonest to pretend that I don't notice the elaborate grace available only to the hidebound. It's an all-or-nothing business, piety, not just inordinately disciplined, but requiring, above all else, humility, which is finally the thing that counts me out. But for an instant, anyway, it seems a pity. On the other hand, what do I know about the thoughts beneath these wigs and huge black hats? Maybe half these people are steeped in doubt, and the other half are flagrant hypocrites, horribly, horribly vain, petty, deceitful, cruel. Their prayers, a variation on the stylized florets that cover every surface of their shul, just one more exaggerated fashion, equally rigid and fanatical, and perhaps equally devoid of passion. Maybe this momentary sense of grace is a function of my own imagination and the ludicrous flamboyance of this place. And even if the Torah was superbly read, I have no right to this ridiculous nostalgia for a thing I never had and, had I survived it, would have hated. Still, those verses do stay in my head, and others like them equally exalted. God's Torah is perfect, says the psalm, and who can argue with a giant-hearted, if somewhat errant, poet king whose realm has just now entered its fourth millennium, if 150 poems is a realm. Besides, I love the vastness of the claim, and depending, of course, how you define perfection, am inclined entirely to agree with him. Call it sentiment, call it protection against heartlessness, homelessness, the evil eye. 
Maybe I'm just sick of indirection, though now I can't even make my way through the, the chanted text, Haftorah, more melodic, but completely unavailable to me. You'd think I'd at least recognize the book. Did he just say Elisha? Maybe kings. I should know what goes with the binding of Isaac, but then I should know a lot of things, which is why I can't renounce the people who know. Look what care they take of my belongings when I myself have all but let them go. They'll even keep safe for me my Sabbath day while I'm off ogling the Paolo Uccello and pray the daily prayers I never pray. I absolutely count on their intransigence. I wouldn't want all of us to go astray. You never know, one day, I might learn reverence, or simply need a perfect word to say, or even to overhear as some believer chants before I continue on my way. Okay. All right, so the next of my books, I'll just read one poem, and it's a sonnet, it's short. Uh, the titled poem is White Thorn. Um, as always, when I see it, my first thought some kids discarded tissues helped by wind have scattered in the hedge caught on thorns. Not, look, winter's finally at an end. Not, this is what it means to bloom for white thorn. It's my greatest failing. I never learn. Or rather, don't apply the things I know. Which is why I have so little to show for my quickly coming up on 50 years. But who wants to know that spring is tatters of dingy whiteness clinging to a briar? Can't just one bush blaze with fire for a single instant that does not consume? Or is this my vision, this stingy bloom? I will say that uh, there are uh, some Song of Songs sonnets in here. And, uh, and I asked Matthew back there last night, I said, can I read that sonnet if my daughter's here? And he said, well, it's a little bit like going to basic instinct with your parents. And then I asked Molly on the phone, I said, can I read some poems about my relationship with your father? She said, don't you have any other poems you can read? <laughs> so if you want to read my Song of Songs sonnets, they're in White Thorn. Okay. We're going to move on to my most recent book. I'll just read one poem from it. It's the Villanelle Chris referred to. Uh, it's Villanelle Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam means repairing the world and it's something Jews are obliged to do. I meant, I quote Voltaire, but I name him long after I quote him, so I'll just let you know that quote is Voltaire. Villanelle, tikkun olam, preparing the wor repairing the world. Should I ask the obvious? Why would God create a world requiring repair? And what was he thinking when he called it good? Unless the perfect is the enemy of the good, was his motto too. Maybe Voltaire was making an obvious reference to God, who clearly got in way over his head, as if banning a piece of fruit was the answer, not to mention thinking knowledge of good and evil was the sin he should forbid. My guess is he didn't imagine murder until Cain made it obvious. Poor God. No wonder he had that temper tantrum cum flood. But he couldn't follow through, couldn't bear to think of forfeiting whatever good he had, albeit haphazardly, created. And so this somewhat slipshod world's still here. Do you think we might do it any good? Obviously, there's no point asking God. So now I'll just read two more poems, one of which is fairly long, what, the first of which is short. They're new poems, and they also quote the Bible, but uh, they're also kind of looking elsewhere. The first of these is Fez Postcard, Call to Prayer. And I just need to tell you that when you go to Fez, you're, if you're lucky, you get taken to a terrace overlooking the site where they dye the letter, the leather. And there are these amazing vats, all different colors. And it's a spectacular site. You see all these vats in all these different colors. And I allude to that here. This is, uh, well, I won't say anymore. Just Fez, postcard, 
call to prayer. A jeweler holds a magnet to his silver to prove its purity, there's no pull. A seller wraps a package for a buyer who's never quite assented to the sale. A flash and then another as a weaver shuttle, shuttles spun agave silk through wool. And then a blast of sound, a change of air. At once the markets hustle bustle trivial. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, even if business does go on as usual. The world seems to refine itself, each color more acute, each syllable, each smell. The sharp scent of cedar where a carpenter planes and sands an ornate floral grill. Cumin laced with cardamom and coriander, the spice seller's stall, rose petal, fennel, or orange blossom just pressed to attar, escaping from a shapely crystal vial. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Every vista turns devotional. The gorgeous rows of vats for dyeing leather, for yellow saffron, for red poppy flower, spearmint mixed with indigo for teal, are bright robed worshipers who've joined to kneel in unison and chant Allahu Akbar. God is great and powerful. As stragglers head to fountains to splash water on hands and feet and face and then unroll the mats they keep with them, each a small but resolutely holy house of prayer. I too was taught that sanctity is portable. Words can be carried anywhere. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, our God also great and powerful, but no sound punctuates the air to call us to our three times daily ritual, unless you count just for the days of awe, the shofar. Here, the otherworldly is habitual, if perhaps ignored, the atmosphere never without at least a telltale trace of the freshly distilled attar of the unabashedly eternal. As if a vial were always running over, ready to anoint each head with oil. A flash in the shuttle of a weaver, a glimmer from a distant market stall. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, even I, failed believer, feel its pull. And this last, uh, it's, in, it's in blank verse, but I call it creative nonfiction, which it is. This is true. I mean, actually, all my poems are creative nonfiction, but this is recent creative nonfiction. It's called My Lookalike at the Krishna Temple. There's a woman who looks just like you in Nepal. Gopal divulges on my ninth or tenth visit to his restaurant, quite exotic for my local strip mall. Not her apparel, of course, she wears a sari. But if she stood beside you, you'd be sisters. I've seen her many times. She lives perhaps three kilometers from my home, worships with my mother in the Krishna temple. Is that the tower in my favorite repeating photo from the electronic frames around his walls? A golden studded brick extravaganza, part chimera, part Himalaya, part exaggeration of a pilgrim's rumor of a glimpsed pagoda for which I've invented over my kofta and yellow doll, a convoluted fable of a woeful Chinese deity in exile on whom some locals have taken pity. But it could be the very place my lookalike approaches every morning for whatever made her mother's mother's mother chant the selfsame patternings of syllables she herself still utters every day, always in a different gold-trimmed sari. 
Yesterday, opal-colored, spangled gold. Tomorrow, amethyst with gold-flecked edges. Today, a remnant from her mother's dowry, diaphanous if threadbare, near black lapis, on which the temple's oil lamps detect smatterings of milky white gold pinpoints. Her mother's legacy, a moonless sky, now miserly, now profligate with stars. For the most part, she's motionless in prayer. But every now and then, her bangled arm, performing some involuntary gesture, clinks a sotto voce tambourine. Gopal cannot quite recall her name. But among the electronic photos, Gopal changes them periodically. A woman does show up with outsized features, smile all gums and teeth, expansive forehead, nose a raptor's beak, socketed eyes, their blackness goaded on by rims of shadow. But there are, I checked, green-eyed people in Nepal. Perhaps even the offspring of the very same marauders whose vodka-driven incursions did Cossacks ever head east, reputedly gave me my own green eyes, my look-alike, in fact, a distant cousin. Let's add a yak wool shawl for every sari a half shade deeper than its sorry silk, swaths of which we'll use for matching slippers. Let's still each wayward bangle with a jewel and then move on to anklets, circlets, nose rings until she's encompassed by a lavishness exceeded only by its attendant silence, enabling us to make out Sanskrit suddenly our native tongue, her prayer's undying string of sumptuous words. I know not any other reality than the lotus-eyed Krishna looking like a heavy-laden cloud, his lower lip like the ruddy bimba fruit. Can she mean it? No other reality? Not even the exploding one inside her head? The harrowing one, the fickle one, the fractious, dazzling, disappearing one. Perhaps she could provide a demonstration of how to live your life in such close quarters, preferably a blow-by-blow blow of every waking minute until I've taken in its far parameters. Divinity, a countenance, complete with lower lip, you could daily gaze upon and live. You'd even know its instrument, the flute, the fabric of its garment, yellow silk. Perhaps that's why she's so meticulous, my look-alike, about her daily saris. Yesterday, sapphire with red-gold swirls. Tomorrow, mother of pearl with bronze-gold petals. But just this moment, her mother's wedding dress, in darkness indigo, but in the light, a skittish onrush of rival factions of discordant fireflies reconciled across a crush of stars. How is it her mind never wanders? That's all mine does at weekly morning prayers, where I can barely focus on saying Kaddish for my own father, the reason I'm there, ritual my single ready ally in an ongoing, mostly losing battle with unprepossessing emptiness. But I'm lost on this new diminished planet where now, unless what Gopal says is true, I'm the last one standing with my face. And even when I try, I'm no good at this. Unconsummated daydreams call my name. How does she manage it, my look-alike? Though where exactly could her mind wander with only a single known reality, which, let's be honest, is all she has? Chances are she's pawned her bangles, if she ever had them. Where's the same all-purpose sari, a hand-me-down from Gopal's mother, cotton shawl, hemp sandals, every day? 
And that was nonsense about the Krishna temple. Ranji and Srinivas told me all about it 19 years ago at Molly's naming. They brought her a tiny silver cup she drank from each Shabbat for years. We love synagogue. We had no idea. It's exactly like Hindu temple. People talking all the time, walking in, walking out, greeting all their friends, shaking hands, not a single one paying attention. Don't tell me my lookalikes in the back telling jokes like me on any given Shabbat morning. That is, once I've finished madly cramming to chant the Torah. I'm a fraud, a hypocrite, a foul weather believer, but I'm also superstitious, hopelessly sentimental, and never waver in devotion to those words. The more incomprehensible, the better especially when I chant them with no vowels or punctuation, just an ornate silver pointer and a scroll. I'll have learned them all by heart and still they'll stagger me. God himself preempting my own voice to humor Moses with his unnamed name, a name even an atheist could get behind, though he'd take issue with its source, a conflagration, a Teflon bramble. Not that pompous, if resonant, I am that I am. That, of course, is a gross mistranslation. But the apologetic, I hear it with a Yiddish inflection, resigned, I will be what I will be, which pretty much covers everything. From a blue ro figure robed in yellow silk to a smooth-talking hermetic threesome to my personal soft spot, a deafening, non-negotiable, abiding silence. Who's that gray-haired lady who chants the Torah? The kids at synagogue ask their teacher, my daughter, who rewards their good behavior, a rare commodity at Hebrew school, by entertaining them with imitations. Who knows, maybe one of them in a few years on junior year abroad in Kathmandu will stop my look-alike as she's walking down the street there's a woman in Salt Lake City who looks just like you. I worshiped with her daughter at the Jewish temple. If only Gopal could remember her name. I've asked him several times. He says he's had no chance to ask his mother. Are there no telephones in Kathmandu? Not only would it secure her existence, but I could speak to her, call out to her, stop her before she starts dressing me up or fabricating cockamamie stories about my great grandmothers and me. Forget it, I'm no use to you, go home. If you like, you can visit Gopal's mother first, then head three kilometers downhill. There's a hole in the floor, beneath the rug, beneath your bed. Uncover it, ignore its contents, until you find a box carved of sandalwood, inlaid with lapis lazuli, white topaz, tourmaline, coral, moonstone, jade. Inside, wrapped in muslin, is a sari woven from untraceable silk thread, each strand colored by a separate hand with its private rarefaction of the blue dominion between sapphire and indigo and braided with a single golden filament. I have no idea who worked the loom or where or how exactly the disparate fibers were beguiled into cloth, but afterward your mother's 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 mother whiled away her decade-long betrothal, embroidering each breadth of gold and azurite with still more strands of gold in Kathmandu. Put it on. Krishna's awaiting you. And I won't lie, look alike. I'm waiting too. Thank you.